All right, so uh, I'm going to start out and give some stories, I guess. Let me stand on my right place about what it was like to be a graduate student in the early days of GPS, and then I'm going to end with some ideas that hopefully will help the future geodesists. Um, I guess one thing I want to talk about is we know at the time that it would be so successful. Ken's just pointed out that even in 1994, people didn't, weren't sure it would be successful. I call this my plastics moment when I was first told you're going to work on GPS. I think about what GPS was like compared to the techniques I learned about at that time, which were VLBI and SLR. I would just point out to people that don't realize it, we weren't the only game in town. People were talking about Priory, that GPS would never be able to do the vertical and we should use absolute gravity. Um, Tom Herring has also brought up the SCUM consortium, which I worked with. So um, this was a group of four universities that made measurements in Southern California and it couldn't have been a better experience in terms of working together. It gave me the opportunity to work with the graduate students shown here. I was able to find pictures for almost everyone. It meant that even though I was the only graduate student at Scripps doing GPS, I could work with all of these people and learn from them and collect data with them. But once you collected the data, well, that was a story. Well, anyway, I, my first data point was collected with Nancy King at Santa Paula, where I nearly froze to death. My next data point was at Vandenberg Air Force Base, which had a mobile VLBI uh, site. I went with Jim Davis. I promptly fell asleep on the floor of the VLBI trailer, and Jim played with the mobile VLBI console the rest of the night. <laughs> James Stowell, I spent four nights with him at Mount Losby, and that's all I'm saying about it. There's just <laughs> nothing, nothing more you can say about James Stowell in this amount of time. So you collect the data, but what the, you know, Jeff Reimuller pointed out how difficult it was to analyze. I would also call out many great colleagues that came to JPL to learn how to use GPS particularly Bodwin Ambrosius, Agur Christensen, and Jan Johansson. I also wanted to call out Will Prescott and Bill Strange. They were in charge of geodesy, at least I thought they were, at the NGS and the USGS. They were great individuals, they were great geodesists, and they were in the trenches with us fixing cycle slips. So I learned a lot from them, and then I also added photos of these other colleagues, senior geodesists, but they were all down in the, like I said, in the trenches with us, learning how to use GPS, and they were always incredibly great colleagues for those of us who were um, getting our PhDs. So why was GPS so successful? I like to explain it to people as, well, you know, a single payer system when the single payer is the defense department. That's a good thing to have in your corner. Um, <laughs> the other thing is surveyors are the market that drove the cost of our receivers down. I think we all owe an enormous debt of gratitude to the IGS for producing orbits for us for the last 20 years, and also to the IRS for making our coordinates. Um, and, okay. So back in 1989, this was the global tracking network I used for my <laughs> dissertation. Uh, data were precious, that's you know the picture there. We needed more sites so we could do orbits. It never in a million years occurred to me that we'd now have over 12,000. This is from Jeff Blue, it gave me this list. I wanted to particularly call out that the open data policy for continuous data has been an enormous boon to creativity and applications we never envisioned in 1998. So I want to thank people because it allows you to have an idea, say, I want to make a tide gauge, and then to go ahead and make it. So I really appreciate the open data policy of UNAVCO. I wanted to stop with some ideas maybe or some comments about, I don't know, the future and things I've learned along the way. I've done a lot of interdisciplinary research. This is a, a plot of snow depth I measured using a GPS receiver. I thought people would be so happy. I mean, you guys are always happy when I show it to you <laughs> that you could actually measure snow depth. But what I found out is they're different kind of hydrologists and you have to find out what they want. Water managers only care what's there on April 1st. They don't care about December. Satellite validation people care about a certain footprint. Climate scientists say come back when you have five years of data. So it's, it's more than that. Second thing I've learned is you're always wrong when you're new. When I was comparing to VLBI, I was wrong, they were right, they turned out they were wrong. Same thing with seismologists. Seismologists thought they were right and they were wrong. <laughs> so on left, I just put this up here. These are t something I worked on. I thought I had the right answer. On the left, it turns out the answer is more complicated on the right. I find myself coming back to problems over and over again and resolve, trying to come up with better answers. And then I thought I would just say, I think we have an obligation to tell people what you do. 
this is an education and outreach site I've put together, and I'd certainly encourage all of you to contribute spotlights about your science. I would be happy to host you on my site so that uh, school children can look at it. <laughs>